Sinclair Lewis was pretty critical of the American middle class, and he was critical in particular of what he saw as its conformity and its complacency. Um, thank you very much for coming to our uh, the first event in our um, uh, grant-funded series, uh, California Reads, um, Searching for Democracy. Um, we are going to have a series of um, discussions of the book, It Can't Happen Here. This is the first one, and then we'll have two more, um, which will begin next Thursday. So... Um, we're very glad you're here. I'm going to turn this over to um, Mary Menzel, who is the director of the California Council for the Book. And uh, I just am just very, very pleased that you all have come. Thank you. Oh, actually, here, give this, give this to someone else. I don't need it. So give that back to them. Thanks, everybody. Ooh, I'm turned on. That's good. Thank you so much for being here on a Saturday afternoon. I'm very happy to see you. I don't want to try to give you a memorized spiel about the California Council for the Humanities Searching for Democracy program, but we are taking part in it right now. California Reads is just one aspect of a year-long program, all sorts of public events having to do with this theme of our democracy and what is our place in it. So I would encourage you on the way out, if you haven't already picked up a Cal Humanities newsletter or one of the one-page descriptions of the Searching for Democracy initiative, please do so. We have a lot of exciting things going on. And we're so pleased that you in Riverside County are taking part in California Reads. Today's format is going to be a conversation between me and Dr. Catherine Yurka, and we are going to have a generous amount of time for your questions at the end, and we'll be passing around a microphone so that you have to talk into the microphone to ask a question, because we are taping this, as you can see, and this is going to be available on our website to people who aren't lucky enough to be here today in person. Dr. Catherine Yurka is a professor of English in the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences at Caltech. She has published extensively on 20th century American literature suburban and urban studies, and Hollywood film. She's the author of White Diaspora, the suburb and the 20th century novel, and her new book published this week is Hollywood 1938, Motion Pictures Greatest Year, which is a history of the American film industry's first organized PR campaign. And that leads me into my first thing I want to ask Dr. Yurka about, because I believe that Hollywood 1938 includes a discussion of how Hollywood turned at the end of the 1930s to more democratic themes or, or less, um, well, or more accessible programs. Can you talk a little bit about Hollywood 1938? Surely. It's pretty fresh in my mind. Uh, so uh, in, in 1938, there's a recession. We're in the middle of the Great Depression. Things have gotten a little bit better starting in 1936. In 1937 and 38, things start to fall apart again. Uh, and the film industry decides that people are, 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 that attendance has fallen off at the movies, not because people have less money, but because they're actually mad at the movies. Um, there's been a lot of bad publicity. There's been some bad films produced. And basically, they decide that theater goers no longer find that the investment in the price of the ticket is worthwhile. They just want to stay away from movies. So they launch this kind of crazy public relations campaign. It's thrown together in a hurry. It ends up being seen as a pretty widespread failure. Uh, and uh, the, the slogan for the campaign was, uh, motion pictures are your best entertainment. And given that the film industry saw its entire mission as providing entertainment for a mass audience, the fact that they had to promote that was already an admission of failure. It was basically telling audiences, it, it was basically admitting to audiences that movies no longer make a sufficient case for their own entertainment value. And uh, they, they, uh, 
they coordinated 94 films with the launch of this public relations campaign. These films were supposed to prove to audiences that motion pictures were their best entertainment. By the end of the year, though, when the campaign was over, oh, yeah, is my mood ringing too much? Sorry. Uh, at the end of the campaign, when they decided, uh, when it was seen as a failure, it was determined that the movies had been really so bad that they, they weren't entertaining for audiences. The movies that had done best were films like You Can't Take It With You and Boys Town. And these films were seen as not being just about entertainment, but as also providing social messages, in particular Boys Town, which was really, in some respects, a kind of lesson in democracy. It's a town, an orphanage that's run for boys, but governed by the boys themselves. And, um, and so critics began to think that what the campaign had proved was that people wanted more than entertainment from their movies. They wanted films that engaged with social themes, uh, events that were going on in the world. Hollywood had really studiously avoided dealing seriously with the depression. Um, tackling international events because they were afraid of both alienating uh, international markets but also offending groups at home. And so, for example, the, the film uh, It Can't Happen Here was supposed to be made. MGM bought the rights to the novel before it had even come out, but very shortly they dropped plans to make the project. And this had to do with a couple of factors. Uh, one was the fact that the film, if it were made, would likely be boycotted in Germany and Italy and perhaps other countries. And they might be so angry that they would boycott MGM films in general. Um, but also, uh, the, f the film industry was so timid about what they could do in terms of representing violence on film and, and they were very hesitant about representing explicitly political themes. And one of the uh, a kind of astonishing features in rereading It Can Happen Here is what a violent novel it is. It's not gratuitously violent, but it's, it's bent on showing the, um, the effects of a fascist regime on um, a democratic citizenry. And, um, and the film industry, when, when they went over, when they reviewed the script to see whether it was suitable for production, they said, um, basically wanted them to cut out all the violence and all the brutality. And so it, and, and so it really, it, what this suggests to me is not, as Sinclair Lewis claimed, that the film industry had decided no film company was allowed to make a film of his book, but rather that the mechanisms for making films in Hollywood simply wouldn't let them treat in a meaningful way as complicated and as important a theme um, as, uh, as, uh, as we find in It Can't Happen Here. So it just wasn't possible to make it. Um, not because it was banned, but because uh, just to show it in a realistic way would, uh, would not have been acceptable. And it was, uh, this novel is much more openly political than earlier books. What are some of his other best known books that probably had already been successfully adapted to film by that time? Yeah, a lot of movies were made uh, from Sinclair Lewis's novels, both silent films and, and talkies. Uh, he was, if you don't know anything about Sinclair Lewis, he was by far the most popular novelist in the 1920s in the United States. Uh, he was also just about the most influential, and his stature as a novelist was cemented in 1930 when he became the first American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. And his, his novels are, are, his early novels are, are extremely delightful. Uh, Main Street was one of the most sensational events in the history of publishing. Uh, he, uh, he attacked the provincialism of American small town life. Uh, in Babbitt, he criticized the uh, consumer culture of the suburbs, and he even gave the English language a new word, Babbitt, in order to describe a certain kind of smug 
and conventional businessman, but one who underneath it all is really pretty dissatisfied with his life, but he's both too comfortable and too afraid to really do anything to buck the status quo. And if you're seeing a theme here, it's that Sinclair Lewis was pretty critical of the American middle class, and he was critical in particular of what he saw as its conformity and its complacency. And, uh, and this was not an unusual criticism to make. Um, intellectuals were uh, quick to point out that America had achieved a great deal in terms of material advancements. We had fantastic indoor plumbing. Our cars were you know, the, the pride of the world. Um, but our spiritual and cultural life really hadn't kept up with the material advances. What was different about Lewis is that people were actually interested in his criticisms. He made people want to read them. He, his novels are so entertaining that he has had such a great ear for the American vernacular. Um, he created these wonderfully robust characters. Um, and so, so he made America want to be self-conscious about itself. And uh, really millions of people read these novels that were savage attacks on many of their, of their readers. So is this why you were, you were saying that Babbitt was a f kind of a forerunner to It Can't Happen Here? Is it sort of a logical extension of that dissatisfied yet complacent and materialistic? Well, something, something rather different is going on in It Can't Happen Here. In Babbitt, the consequences of conformity and complacency are the suburban businessman's kind of spiritual malaise. So it doesn't come across as a particularly serious problem. And it can't happen here. The consequences are far more dire. I mean, um, and the way that complacency works in the novel is evident in the title. It can't happen here. This is the mantra that these uh, small town Vermont residents chant to themselves um, to deny sort of the political um, a takeover that's going on around them, and they continue to say it can't happen here, even as they're acknowledging, oh, it is happening here right now to ourselves and our families, and uh, and so so the, so the the cost of complacency and conformity is not just spiritual malaise; it's the metaphorical death of democracy, and it's the quite literal death of friends, neighbors, um, and the people that you love. Um, who end up being slaughtered by by the the, not, the fascist regime that that takes over the government? We were talking about Philip Roth's uh, much more recent book, *The Plot Against America*, which has another take on it could happen here. The wrong people could get in charge of us with our own in our own. Uh, we will make our own problem because we won't be alert to people who are bringing out the worst in us, who are appealing to our worst impulses. And I think a lot of us enjoy reading dystopian fiction of many kinds. And then there, there are a lot of thrillers, like what if Hitler had won uh, World War II. Do you think there are some strengths and some weaknesses to the way Sinclair Lewis um, handled this scenario? It is a fairly, I mean, he's dealing with what is felt in the 1930s to be a very urgent problem. And I mean, it's not as though people thought, wow, fascism, that could never happen. I mean, it had happened in Germany, it had happened in Italy. Uh, and there were demagogues who had achieved a surprising amount of political power within the United States. So he, he really sees his mission is to be warning people about what could happen if a demagogue were elected president. So he is, it's a, in many ways a fairly preachy novel. There's a lot of talking at you. Um, and, and somewhat less, uh, less action than, uh, than we would like in the first half. Um, later on, though, um, after these complacent and conformist characters end up joining the resistance, they become uh, much more, uh, they, they're, there's a, lo a lot more happens. They're imprisoned, they're sent to concentration camps. They are, uh, they are tortured, um, so it becomes 
uh, it, it becomes a, a page turner at that point and something that I yes. think is. So, so try it again. If you gave up before you got to about page 120 or so, give it another try. <laughs> Um, is there anything else we need to know about him or about the context of the times in order to really get the book? Well, um, I think one thing that's kind of interesting about, um, about Lewis, uh, Lewis's life in relation to It Can't Happen Here is that he probably would not have written it if he had not been married to one of the most prominent political journalists of the day. Uh, Dorothy Thompson. Oh, tell us about her. Yes, yeah, she uh, she was the first woman to have a regular newspaper column that dealt with international affairs. In 1931, she interviews Hitler, which is a big deal for an American journalist. And in 1932, she publishes a book, I Saw Hitler, which is a warning to the world about what his rise to power in Germany will mean. And uh, Hitler was not very happy with her characterization, however. Uh, she called him a little man, I think. And, uh, and little men do not like to be told they're little no. men. And so, and so she had the honor of being the first American journalist to be kicked out of Nazi Germany in 1934. And because Lewis was not primarily a political novelist, I think it was really her expertise her interest in these issues, and the kind of conversations that happened in their house as a result of her contacts in the political international um, journalist community that um, helped him to become more interested in the novel. In terms of the domestic situation, I've, been, I've mentioned fascism in, in Europe, but, um, but the depression and all of the turmoil that it caused was obviously a big factor in the context um, in which Lewis is writing. Uh, people have lost jobs, they've lost houses, they've lost bank accounts, poverty is rampant. Um, and at this time, there is really no um, safety net to speak of. In fact, Lewis completes It Can't Happen Here in August of 1935. That's the same month in which the Social Security legislation passes. It's a New Deal program, but it's late in the New Deal era. It doesn't start paying out or even um, taking in until 1937. So people are really hurting. And what, what, Lewis, what worried Lewis was the idea that people would be willing to elect a strong and charismatic political leader who would um, perhaps want to take some of their rights, but in exchange would promise economic security and stability, which is what people deeply needed in 1935. And one of the chilling things about the novel is that the folksy, plain-speaking Buzz Windrip, who becomes the president, he's absolutely clear about his desire to assume dictatorial powers if elected. He runs on a platform in which he promises to make Congress advisory um, and to do the same with the Supreme Court. So there will be no checks and balances of power anymore. We will have an, a, a president with absolute power. And why would people vote for this? Well, because he promises to redistribute wealth. He will put uh, limits on personal income and fortunes, and he will basically give, he promises to give basically every person in the US $5,000. I should say this is one of the campaign promises that he does not keep. <laughs> and lest this sound just completely ridiculous and outlandish, um, this was a proposal that uh, was getting some traction in the mid 1930s. Buzz Windrip is modeled after a real politician, Huey Long who was the governor of Louisiana and later a US senator. And he was a corrupt politician and ruthlessly consolidated his political power. And um, the, the program that Windrip um, articulates for, uh, for uh, redistributing wealth is straight out of Huey Long's playbook. And that's in part why he was uh, a successful politician is he was very, uh, very popular with, with the poor. And, uh, and so, so Lewis is, uh, is drawing directly from the historical events at the time in drawing this character. And I should say that one thing that I find quite interesting about the novel and that was a little unusual for the time 
is that Huey Long isn't just the model for a character. He also appears in the novel. He's mentioned several times. And in, he was in, assassinated just before it was published. And Sinclair Lewis rushed to his publisher and said, you have to change all the references to the late Huey Long, because he wanted to be as timely and up to date as, uh, as he possibly could. But it's this combination of make-believe characters and real people gives the novel a kind of immediacy that it wouldn't otherwise have. So when he talks about journalists having been rounded up and imprisoned and sent to concentration camps, he is, it's not just a list of names that are made up and mean nothing. It's names of people that you would have known in the 1930s. It's Haywood Brown. It's uh, William Allen White. It's um, Granville Hicks. Um, and so it, these, the, the, the use of these real people uh, in the novel really helps to convey that sense of urgency that was so important to Lewis in, in publishing it. Well, although now it makes it kind of heavy going because some of these characters, their reputation lasts and they're in the history books and others have been kind of lost to us. The, the uh, demagogue priest was a real character, Father uh, Coughlin? Was it Coughlin, name? yes. And it's a little bit heavy going if you're not familiar with this. And I think, I think in some ways a veil has been kind of drawn over the 30s because certainly in my generation, you know, dad was in World War II and mom talks about being a, a child of the Depression. So we're familiar with the deprivation of the Depression. We're familiar with the country pulling together and what happened in World War II. And the idea that our country was really riven with these political upheavals of the 30s and no one knew what was going to happen um, for good or for ill in our country, I, I just don't think we're very aware of that. And so the book seems kind of over the top to us. Uh, well, I think it's certainly much more over the top than it did in the 1930s. I mean, one thing that was nice, I mean, I think that Sinclair Lewis was very shrewd, that by calling it, it can't happen here, he made it really hard for critics to respond to the novel oh. by saying it can't happen here, because they risked sounding as fatuous as some of the characters in the novel who were trying to deny what was going on all around them. And I did look at some reviews that appeared, and what they tended to say was, what they tended to resist was Lewis's particular characterization of fascism. So for example, Time Magazine says, Lewis's version of fascism is just too weird to be alarming or convincing. And, and, the, and another way that this objection is stated by, by, by a few others is that they, they, they took exception to the way that he seemed to just graft Nazism onto the American political scene. Here was a writer who had such a feeling for, um, for American manners and mores, for our culture and traditions, even if he often used this feeling to mock them. And for him to just ignore the differences in history and tradition and culture that would lend, um, that would make us have a very different political system, even if it went toward a fascistic direction um, from Germany. People just thought that, that there, was, there needed to be something more organic about the fascism that developed in the novel. It was too much just like Nazism. So, so while, they, while they didn't really want to say it can't happen here, they were pretty comfortable saying, if it did, it wouldn't, ha it wouldn't look like this. It couldn't happen like this. But the book did sell well. Yes, it was, it was very successful. I mean, that was, that was part of you know, Lewis winning the, the Nobel Prize, the first American to win the Nobel Prize for literature in 1930, is people paid attention to his novels. Uh, it, I think it, it didn't hurt that his two previous novels in the 1930s are both considered failures and did not do as well. And so when It Can't, um, when it Can't Happen Here came out, because it was dealing with such an important contemporary theme, and it just wasn't as trivial as the previous two novels, um, and uh, it was really a cause celeb. It did very, very well, and really helped to reestablish his uh, reputation in the mid-1930s. Oh. And the Nobel Prize for Literature is for a body of work rather than one particular title, is that right? Yes. It's, it's funny because some people were dismayed that Lewis had won the Nobel Prize. They thought there were other American writers more deserving, such as Edith Wharton and Theodore Dreiser. 
and, uh, and people speculated that the reason Lewis had won was because his novels such as Main Street and Babbitt so perfectly confirmed the stereotypes that Europeans had about <laughs> Americans, so that we were a bunch of provincial vulgarians who had achieved nothing in the way of spiritual or cultural fulfillment. And it's said that Lewis, uh, resent, that by the late 1920s, Lewis was resenting some of the European characterizations of his work, and that's one reason that some of his some of his satire was softened. Um, later in his career, as he wanted to stop giving fodder to those to oh. those Europeans. <laughs> I see. Well, was he personally a curmudgeonly, pessimistic, alcoholic, you know, classic writer type, or uh, he was definitely an alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, and that is, I mean. He, there's some question about whether he died of alcoholism or if he died of all of the health problems that alcoholism creates. I mean, he, he suffered, I mean, he, he had a disease and he was unwilling really to, to solve his problem. He was, I mean, he could be quite prickly and, um, and difficult. Um, he also, by all reports, was one of the most entertaining men. He loved to perform. In fact, he did some plays of his own books and, and performed in them. Um, and so if you had him over to a dinner party, he would entertain everyone for six hours and then go home. Uh, so, so he actually sounds like, uh, to me, like an enormous amount of fun. Um, but, uh, but I think, I mean, one of the things that many people noticed about his work is, okay, here he is mocking these middle class characters. But at the same time, he's enormously fond of them, that he's as much of a sentimentalist as he is a satirist. And, and Lewis basically admitted as much. And if you want evidence that he has a kind of more optimistic view of human nature, I mean, I think you can look at it can't happen here. Okay, yes, complacency and conformity certainly help to um, uh, usher in uh, fascism. The people aren't, they don't struggle hard enough to resist it. But once the full horror of the regime um, dawns upon them, and once they really, uh, they and their, their friends and neighbors start to suffer under it, um, many of the characters in the novel join the resistance. They risk their lives to publicize the brutal atrocities of the regime. As I mentioned, they're imprisoned, they are sent to concentration camps, they are tortured, some of them are murdered. And so, you know, I, th I think it says a lot about Lewis's view of his fellow citizens that he was uh, that he was willing to grant them such agency in the face of total oppression, um, and that he that he really did imagine that there was um, you know in this resistance scenario that there was there was some hope about how how people would behave. Well, I kept going back and forth as I read thinking about class warfare and thinking about the protagonist being an educated man, a newspaper editor. And more than once, Lewis writes about a working class person to whom our hero has been kind in the past or perhaps given you know, charity to, who is tremendously resented by the working class guy, who turns against him as soon as Windrip gets into power. And I felt like there was a little bit of a pattern of that in the book that made me uncomfortable as if I really didn't believe that Lewis thought that all working class people just, you know, would, would give in to their very worst natures if ever they got a, an opportunity. But it did seem to be a pattern in the book. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing, Lewis was very popular in Russia. Um, he, they liked his attacks on um, petty bourgeois society, although they didn't think he was socially advanced enough to realize that communism was the obvious solution. Well, yes, he missed um, there. Yeah. But, um, but one of the things that they did object to was the depiction of labor and, of course, the absence of a labor movement in playing any role in the, in the resistance. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I mean, there really is, it, it, I mean, Lewis, the world that Lewis was comfortable with was the bourgeois world. It was middle class Americans. And so this character, Shad, Shad Ledoux, I think that you're referring to, is portrayed in an incredibly ugly light um, as just selfish and 
and and brutal. Um, but I I don't th I mean I don't think he's meant to uh, I don't think he's meant to represent the working class. I think he's meant to represent um, the person that Lewis feared that would be attracted to the demagogue as a solution to particular economic problems. I mean, he's mm -hmm. one of those people who's really excited about that five thousand uh, dollars that he's that he's going to, going to get. And I should say that Lewis, he was very his political ideals were pretty vague um, in general, but uh, but he uh, but he was a very left leaning person, um, and so. Um, the way he talks about the persecution of blacks under the Winter regime, the way he talks about anti-Semitism in the novel, I mean, you can definitely see a very liberal consciousness mm -hmm. at work, even if it's not especially enlightened in relation to that, that working class character. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's true that that working class character never enjoys doing a good day's work. Right. Um, yeah. He never has pride in who he is the way some working class characters in the book do. And right, like those who work in the for the newspaper. You know, there's the yeah. printer, um, but they're not presented as a worker in the way that Shad is. Mm -hmm. um, they're more like the you know the colleagues of of Dormus Jessup. Mm -hmm. He's the hero of the novel, the newspaper editor. Overall, do you think it's an important book or relevant book? for us to read in 2012, in the 21st century? Has it, has it aged well enough that you think it's relevant and thought-provoking now? I think, I think it does have some relevance. I mean, if you're, if you're worried about a fascist takeover, <laughs> that I think would put you at, a, at an extreme end of the American political spectrum. So I wouldn't, I don't think I would advocate it on the, the grounds that it warns us about what might happen in terms of political leadership um, in the near future. Um, but I do think there are sort of subtle aspects to it that are relevant for us. And I, one quote that I wrote down is, um, this is a realization that the hero, um, Dormus Jessup, comes to rather late in the novel. Everything that is worthwhile in the world has been accomplished by the free, inquiring, critical spirit and the preservation of this spirit is more important than any social system whatsoever. Okay, of course, as a political philosophy, this is a little bit weak. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the point about um, the critical spirit, I think, is, is really crucial. And it reminded me um, of during the Iraq War, when if you were to criticize the war, um, you really risked being denounced as unpatriotic. Um, if you wanted the troops to come home, you were told that you did not, you were failing to support them. And terms like unpatriotic, um, sort of angry words like that, are really designed to um, suppress um, speech and to restrict the kind of messy conversation when you've got different points of view that are really fundamental to a democracy. It also reminds me of, uh, well, I started thinking about the town hall meetings that were being conducted across the country a few years ago. And uh, one thing that routinely happened at these meetings is they would be broken up by people in the audience booing or shouting. And it made it possible to have a kind of civil conversation about very important political issues in this country. I believe many of them were organized around the healthcare debate. And what these people were doing was not being, well, they were being rude to the speaker, um, but they were being so rude to their fellow citizens because they weren't allowing them to participate critically in a necessary conversation in a democracy. So, so when I think about people wanting to restore civility in democracy, I think not just about restoring good manners, although good manners are always very nice, um, but I think of it more as um, enabling um, everyone to participate in the conversation. When you're shouting people down, you are being anti-democratic. And when you're basically making it impossible for politicians to continue having town hall meetings, which is a really ideal forum in a representative democracy, you're, you're being anti-democratic. Um, one other point of relevance that occurred to me was uh, when Windrip gets rid of the Supreme Court. He decides it's not even gonna be advisory, it's just gone. Um, and that reminded me of um, something that's come up quite recently with this, um, this sort of idea of the activist judge. 
I have to say that that's a term that I find very disturbing because I think what it means, an activist judge is basically a judge you don't agree with. And so if you like the judge's opinion, then the judge is interpreting the law. If you dislike the judge's opinion, the judge is um, legislating from the bench. And, um, and I think that that's a really harmful way to view the judicial process. And a few months ago, one of the Republican candidates was actually floating the idea of having US law enforcement agents, I mean, more or less arrest judges and bring them to Congress and force them to explain why they would make certain controversial decisions. And I mean, talk about an inroad into the separation of powers, checks and balances, and the democratic process. And I think that's really what Lewis is trying to warn us against. He's trying to get us to be vigilant and to look out not for the fascist who's going to take us over, but these small inroads to democracy, which, when they add up, can lead to some big problems with it. You're reminding me, I always like to make a little pitch. I don't know if your community is officially reading the annotated constitution that we have suggested as part of California Reads, there are lots of annotated constitutions out there. We happen to think that the one we chose is great. It's very compact. You can stick it in your purse or your pocket. Take a look and see what's in our constitution. It's actually very interesting if you haven't looked at the document. And a good annotated constitution will really help you understand where our country was when the document was written and who these people were who wrote it, and a little bit of what they had in mind. Um, we are going to have a staff member with a microphone to take your questions. Who is going to stand up with the microphone? Is it, oh, will you stand up right now, Tonya, please, so people can see you. If you would like to ask a question, wave at Tonya. You're so visible in your red coat. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So while you are preparing your questions and getting ready to wave at Tonya, uh, I just want to ask you, Dr. Yurka, about, um, about heroism, because you write about film, and you've seen just about every film there is, and you know a lot about Hollywood. And I kept going back and forth thinking about our protagonist in It Can't Happen Here is presented over and over as somebody who doesn't even know why he's doing the right thing. It takes him a really long time to get around to doing the right thing, if you think that resistance against fascism is the right thing to do. He talks in detail about having a wife and family really holds you back from sticking your neck out. And he just progresses very slowly into being the hero of the story because he does to us the right thing. But did you, do you think that's a heroic protagonist? Did he feel like a hero to you? Do you think he would be a Hollywood hero? <laughs> so I'm, I'm really pain adverse, so anyone who risks being tortured <laughs> and in fact is tortured and refuses to reveal the people who are complicit in the plot with him, he counts as a hero <laughs> for me. Um, but he's an ordinary hero, and I think that's part of Lewis's point. He's not, he's not a particular, I mean, he's an editor of the small town newspaper, so on one level, he is a kind of leader. Um, within the community, but he's not someone who's remarkable in any way, and a lot of critics of the novel, not critics, not people who are critical of it, but people who wrote about it, reviewed it, said that this guy's kind of a babbit. He's just this, you know, he's conventional, he's, he's satisfied with himself and his life. Um, and, uh, and, and he doesn't, I mean, I think what makes him a hero is that he's so not a hero. Um, and what he does is so beyond anything he could have imagined um, him possibly achieving. I mean, he's, he refuses to make those sacrifices for a long time. And then he finally realizes that it's only through the efforts of ordinary citizens who are going to take these risks that anything will ever change and they will ever get their democracy back. So, so I, fi I, do fi I find him much more persuasive as a hero than the superheroes and the people who just are, you know, born to born to be heroes because it's he's more relatable because I think he is that that quality of enjoying his family, liking running a newspaper, you know, just being satisfied with his life is more like we are than the people who you know may seem more um, more objectively heroic in in the conventional sense of that term. I think it's always good to remember that courage doesn't mean that you don't feel fear. You know, courage means that you're terrified and you do it anyway because mm -hmm. it's the right thing to and do. And that's certainly that's certainly his case. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
All right, let's see some hands. Let's hear some questions. Yes, Tonya is coming up on you right now. Uh, during the uh, seven or 1930s, was um, there any publicity or, or talk of comparing um, John Steinbeck and Sinclair Lewis uh, in their books that they wrote? Because there are some similarities there of addressing problems like this. Um, you know, I, that's an excellent question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I would say that this novel is, a, is more characteristic of the kind of concerns that a Steinbeck would show than many of Lewis's other novels. I mean, Lewis was a satirist, so he wrote these satires and he exaggerated as a way of trying to get at some kind of truth. Steinbeck was not, in, his satire was not his, his, <laughs> his, his medium. I mean, he wrote um, very hard-hitting, compelling uh, dramas. I mean, I, I do think, you know, the, the Grapes of Wrath is one of the great, it's not just one of the great novels of the Depression, it's one of the great social documents. And it, in, to that extent, I think Steinbeck and Lewis do have something, something in common, because, I mean, Lewis's force as a novelist wasn't so much as a literary figure, it, it was as a sociologist, but a sociologist who kind of made stuff up, <laughs> too. Where, whereas, you know, the documentation that's involved in, uh, in, in a novel like The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, Lewis did, he, he also did research, like Steinbeck did, because he wanted to learn something about the, whatever, um, you know, whatever milieu he was going to be um, tackling in his next novel. But, um, but it was, you know, e even with It Can't Happen Here, which is on such a serious subject, there are degrees to which people have a hard time taking it seriously just because of his reputation um, and because of the tremendous, um, the, the wit um, that he exercises in his other, other novels. You mentioned that people may have had a problem taking his book seriously because of his previous wit. Um, looking at some of the things he wrote before this and the style that he wrote this in, do you think that this may have been primarily driven by his wife's experience or sort of dictated by her? Is, do you think this was sort of out of character for him and may, that may have been the reason why? I think, um, I think it is a little bit. I mean, like I said, he, he and his wife were both very left-leaning. So, uh, so the, the anti-fascist politics were something that I believe he wholeheartedly embraced and would have done whether he was married to Dorothy Thompson or not. I think writing a whole novel on this subject, I, th I think it was the milieu into which her profession thrust him that probably helped to motivate him. I mean, I know his biographer says explicitly, his biographer is incredibly unsympathetic to Lewis, and so it's, it's, hard, it's hard to take everything he says seriously, but, uh, but he says Lewis would certainly not have written this novel if he had not been married to Dorothy Thompson. I wouldn't want to go that far. Um, but I do think she exerted an enormous uh, influence uh, influence on it. Uh, I was wondering if I'm, I'm sure Lewis, having been a, a very brilliant and intellectual man, must have read Mein Kampf and uh, Berzelius Windrup's uh, book Zero Hour seems to be a, a direct comment on Hitler and what because Mein Kampf is obviously everything Hitler plotted and planned, and, it's, and, and Winthrop obviously straightforwardly says exactly. Do you think that Lewis was taking from that, looking at that as an extreme part of the time in the world around him and focusing it in upon uh, our own community as a serious social and political problem? Do you think that Mein Kampf and uh, that, that Hitler and Windrup have, a, in, in Lewis's mind, a connection of some real depth in, in terms of what he's expressing through the novel. I think that's a superb observation. It's not one that had occurred to me, but I think, I think that's right. Um, what, uh, uh, what, uh, what's being referred to here is 
um, every chapter begins with an epigraph from a kind of memoir political uh, tract that uh, Buzz uh, Windrip has written. Um, and it's very long-winded, almost unreadable, as I understand Mein Kampf is too. Um, and, um, and, and I think part of the importance of, uh, of those epigraphs is that's really the only point at which we hear, or one of the few points where we really hear Buzz Windrip's voice and where we're allowed to get a sense of why on earth these people would vote for him. And it's because he presents himself as a man of the people. He, too, I mean, basically everyone in a Lewis novel is a Babbitt. <laughs> and he comes across as a Babbitt, very plain speaking, just folks, you know, just like one of you. And he addresses the people in the language of the people. And I think that's all, I mean, you know, the... I think Lewis was worried about these demagogues who were coming up as populist leaders through this um, pitch to being just like the constituencies um, they wanted to vote for them, and uh, and he wanted to warn you know he wanted to warn them against what might really lurk within such people. I mean, one of one of the big benefits of a novel like this is if this had been written by someone else, I, I don't think it would matter as much. And it would not have mattered nearly as much at the time, is that what it meant for Sinclair Lewis to publish this novel is lots and lots of people read it and talked about it. And so he, it was a message novel. And because he was the man who wrote it, that message really got out and really circulated. It also circulated, interestingly enough, when MGM refused to make the film, he sold the rights to the Federal Theater Project. And this was a New Deal program. The New Deal had all sorts of cool programs. And it was basically a stimulus package. We hear, we hear that term used a lot today. Um, and you know, part of it was construction stuff, so you build roads and you build bridges. But a lot of that money was also directed toward putting artists to work. If you've gone inside a 1930s post office and you see a beautiful mural, that mural might have been paid for by the government to give an out of work, to give out of work artists a job. If you've seen those wonderful photographs of migrants from Oklahoma, um, from the Dust Bowl that settled in California, those were likely taken by photographers who worked for the government and were hired to document um, social conditions in contemporary America. Well, the Federal Theater Project worked the same way. It put out-of-work directors, writers, actors, and stagehands um, to work producing plays very often with a more sort of left-wing or liberal theme. And what's interesting about It Can Happen Here um, is that it, it uh, it appeared in 21 sorry in 21 theaters in 18 cities simultaneously, and so um, and and local communities um, messed with it to try to tailor it to their needs. So there, it played in two theaters in LA and three in New York. One in each city did a Yiddish performance. In Seattle, it was done with an all black cast. Uh, in Colorado, they said, this doesn't take place in Vermont. It takes place right here in Colorado. In Tampa, uh, they changed the location from Vermont to Cuba, and they conducted the play in Spanish. And so, I mean, and, and the, the idea of, ma of turning the novel into a living document and then making it um, more immediate and more urgent by tailoring it to the local, um, local needs of the community, I think is a really very special um, aspect of, of how that text got circulated beyond just as books that people read. And apparently the play was very successful. Well, they had a lot of performances at the end of last year, didn't they? Oh, did they? I believe the, the play was performed all over, certainly Southern California. Oh, God, I just didn't. Uh, where was I? <laughs> where was I? You mentioned that the uh, the program that was being done by the government had a lot of uh, liberal and, and kind of left-wing uh, stage productions and that him and his wife both shared a lot of liberal ideas. Um, do you think that it's more indicative of the time that this was written or the times now that dystopian no novels and literature seems to be primarily a right-wing uh, kind of field these days? Ooh, that's interesting. You know, I have to say, I was kind of, I was kind of chuckling when Mary talked about people who like dystopic fiction, because I don't. <laughs> Um, but, um, I mean, certainly uh, I think that uh, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 would fall into the more liberal, um, liberal camp. And I, I can't speak to the contemporary scene, but certainly, I mean, 
even the, the fact that I'm using the word liberal, liberal, liberal so freely, I mean, in a lot of circles, the word liberal is a bad word. It was not in the 1930s. I mean, that, you know, the Depression really um, made a kind of left-wing politics much more viable, much more possible. And I should say that even though I've been touting um, Lewis as, as, a, as a liberal and as being left-wing, um, it's worth mentioning that he uh, he's pretty anti-communist and it can't happen here. Dormus Jessup keeps flirting with the idea and then he decides, no way, I can't go for this communism stuff because it would mean that I wouldn't be able to say what I wanted and I couldn't have a private bedroom. And that's Lewis. I mean, that's that's Lewis, you know, sort of saying something serious, but you know, with a joke, um, kind of worked into it. So yes, you take it seriously, but at the same time, you know, there's that kind of distancing mechanism as well. So, so his was a liberal. I mean, he was, you know, pr uh, he was anti-racist, anti-fascist, anti-communist, also in anti-capitalist, um, I mean, he makes it clear that the reason fascism is allowed to flourish is not just because the Dormus Jessops aren't willing to protest and fight against it enough, but is because of big business. The big business is the only one, is the only group, aside from the, a few politicians and the militia that, um, that support them. A big business is really the only group that does well under, um, so, and that's, that's a, a criticism a lot of people make of Lewis. Okay, okay, Capitalism's out, or at least capitalism in its current form out. Communism mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. fascism out. <laughs> what, what's left? And there's really not. I mean, he he doesn't articulate the positive values or the positive form of government that he would have as an alternative. He's great at tearing things down. He has a harder time proposing solutions. Don't be shy. It's a small room. Hang on one sec. I have a quote that um, comes to mind when we talk about this subject, and it's a quote that I came across and in um, recently. The price of apathy toward public affairs is to be ruled by evil men. To be ruled by? Evil men. And that's uh, by Plato. So <laughs> the, our concern about um, things going awry is, is not new. But I, I still feel, I'm not an alarmist, but I think we need to vigilantly watch what's going on. And because of um, something like uh, what's portrayed in it can happen here, could happen. If, and the way to move people over to your point of view is to move them an inch at a time. I, I, what you're saying makes you the ideal reader of it can't happen here. I mean, because <laughs> you don't you don't read it because fascists take over the government is imminent. You read it because you think vigilance is important and you think um, uh, awareness and um, and the right and and criticizing. You know, when when someone when your government does something wrong. I mean, you know. Criticism is when it's denounced as unpatriotic, you know, the way I think about it is no, like these are people who love their country enough to try to hold it up to its highest ideals of itself. So, so I suggest you read the book <laughs> if you haven't already. <laughs> Freedom of speech is so important to us that we need to make sure that, that we continue to have that and not let. Um, uh, us, our society be moved an inch at a time over to where you can't say what you want or mm -hmm. any kind of uh, talk against the government is, is seditious. Um, I, I, and I think it's very important um, on, this, on this note that, um, that the, the hero is a newspaper editor. I mean, if freedom of speech, freedom of the press, it's not just that those are the First Amendment, they're the first amendment. And those, uh, I mean, Lewis is making the point that a free press is absolutely critical to the functioning of a democracy. And this is where the context of the 1930s is important too, is in, in the 30s, um, the, pr the n newspaper industry was seen as very much endangered, um, much like it is now, although the internet was not, of course, playing any sort of a role in that problem. 
and it was the depression, so a lot of newspapers were folding because of declines in ad revenues and circulation. But the real threat was also seen to be the rise of chain newspapers. And there was seen to be a risk of monopoly of news because it's long been held that essential to a democracy is an informed citizenry, um, and they are informed by a free press. And the real villain for Sinclair Lewis in this regard was William Randolph Hearst. And just to give you a sense of the extent of Hearst's media empire, this is just to talk about his newspapers, not to talk about the radio stations, the magazines, or the movies. Um, but he controlled in 1935 um, 13, over 13% of the daily circulation of American newspapers. That means more than one in 10 newspapers that circulated was a Hearst paper. Um, and he controlled over 22% of Sunday circulation. So here you have one individual who was responsible with discharging news. And he was not a, um, you know, an unbiased <laughs> newspaper man, the way that, the way that Jessup is, is really shown to be, at least in the, in the beginning. Um, and Hearst is, a, is one of those real people who figures quite prominently in the novel and not, I mean, Hearst must have been furious at this characterization. It, it must have made him madder than anything before Citizen Kane uh, because he's, it's his newspapers that before Windrip is elected, I believe are the only ones that support Windrip. The only ones that are too stupid to know when there's gonna be a fascist takeover of the country. Um, and so, so, I, so I do think, so free speech, free press, that on some level that, I mean, it, the militia matters. The rule by force matters, but it, it, the rule by force is absolutely insufficient without the suppression of the newspapers and the press. That that is really, um, that is um, key to the death of democracy within that novel. Yeah, this is uh, kind of speculative, but um, do you think that a writer writing today could have the same kind of impact, um, the same kind of effect on shaping um, public perceptions and influencing the way people think about um, social reality that, um, that he had back at that time? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that I think the extreme partisanship within our country that if, I mean, I, I can't imagine a novel just like that, the fascist takeover um, scenario operating in the same way at all or being taken really seriously. But if there was, you know, so, I mean, you know, Obama's called a socialist. <laughs> if we get the socialist takeover or if there's some kind of attack on Republican leadership, I think the nature of partisanship is that it would just be seen, I mean, this, this wasn't particularly seen as like, oh, a left winger going crazy on the topic of fascism. And I think that the way a novel like this would be parsed today, it's either like the right wing attack or the left wing attack. And so that would give half the country an excuse to hate it without reading it um, or to criticize it if they did. So, so I, I can't, I, I, but I, I don't, I mean, this is my very speculative answer to your very speculative. Uh, question is, I just, I don't see the political climate in this country lending itself toward a, a kind of universal interest in a novel of this kind. I would just like to comment that um, the way our government is set up that with the different branches of government, when you talk about partisanship, our government was never intended to make it easy to make big changes. And so once that is um, broken down, and when that starts to break down, then um, also you, you, you can see that changes perhaps un, uh, loss of freedoms or undesirable results or more, more easily can come about. Well, th I mean, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and I think that, I, but I think that, I think that's an important point to make without having recourse to terms like, 
oh, if so-and-so proposes a big change, he's a socialist. Because ter a term like socialist, like what you're saying is designed to produce conversation and debate, and democracy is all about debate. It's all about people who disagree, discussing their disagreements, trying to persuade the other person, sometimes succeeding, sometimes failing. Um, these terms like unpatriotic and socialist they're not designed to produce debate. I think they're really designed to shut it down. And so that's the problem that I have, I have with, those, with, with the kinds of labels that people um, produce um, that are trying to pretend like they're really confronting the issue, but are just, they don't want to discuss it. End of, end of story. A couple of times you've referred to democracy as messy. It is messy. It is messy. Yeah. <laughs> is it supposed to be messy? Uh, Why is it messy? It's messy because of uh, because people don't agree. Um, people don't agree. People don't even agree on what a democracy should be. Um, but you know, whether you have a two-party system or not, there are people who have um, different ideas that come into conflict, and so uh, so it's. Uh, I, I mean, I think disagreement passions run high. Um, people are not, people argue from emotion as well as reason. So I think there's a, a messiness to the logic of it in, in, uh, at times in discussions. But, um, but I think, you know, it's, it's what we have is a blueprint for how things work, but not, and, and a kind of set of rules that allow for enormous interpretations within those rules. And whenever you're doing interpretive work, people, people disagree, disagree and it gets messy. I say this as someone who interprets text for a living. Nothing is, nothing is tricky as the Constitution, though, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'd like to make another comment about, your comment about socialism. And um, I think in, in labeling what uh, sentiments are, whether they're socialists or communists or, or whatever, the, um, I think the book shows that there's no perfect um, ideology. And we, we have the freedom of speech the freedom of exchanging ideas. And I think there's always a movement of trying to make things better or more perfect. But I think this book, when you read it from beginning to end, you see that no, no um, ideology can be perfect. Uh, and the behavior of human behavior um, is not necessarily better because of the ideological changes. Um, if you take the example of Shad Ledoux, who was a worker working for um, upper income, middle income class people, and he had a resentment about what they had, and he was jealous of what they had, and um, he was working at the lower end of the scale. But then, on the other hand, did he work towards making himself more capable of uh, higher income levels, for example. And what happened in the end to him, in, to him was he was so, he was um, a complete defender of the, the new um, regime. And yet, when it was discovered that he himself uh, embezzled uh, or had his own illegal scheme going, and, which we didn't find out until the end, nearly near the end, that um, he was not, he made a statement, he wasn't happier than he had been before. In addition to that, he uh, became greedy in his position and it was his downfall. So the new ideology did not change the human person for the better. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's a, that's a, great, a great point. Um, and uh, and the, the moment that you refer to where I mean, he's just, he's this incredibly brutal character. I mean, Lewis has no sympathy for him whatsoever. You would, you would agree. Um, he's, yes, he's, he works for Dormus's family. They treat him very well, but he just refuses to work. I mean, he's going around just trying to convince people to elect Buzz Windrup, and Dormus notes that he's doing it on his time. <laughs> you know, he's, he's paying him to work, and he's off, you know, politicking. But Dormus is also weak. He's too weak to fire him, and then eventually he does. But, you know, by then, Shad already has a place in the new, in the new regime. But he, he goes on to reflect, you know, oh, I thought, you know, I thought all this power would make me happy, but it really doesn't. I'm lonely. And th again, that's the Sinclair Lewis sort of sentimentalization of, of the problem. It's both a kind of hu human 
element to a, a novel that's where people are often politics. Um, so it's it's a it's an eruption of some kind of humanity within within Shad, um, but it's also um, it's also such a strange thing to focus on given you know all of the brutality that's going on um, that's going on within the novel. But the the corpus, which is the name of the regime, certainly doesn't make him a better person. He is the kind of person that the corpus preys upon because that's their market. That's their constituency. He wants, he doesn't want to be a laborer anymore. He wants his $5,000. So he starts out lazy and selfish, and he kind of ends up lazy and selfish. And then he's actually murdered by, um, by people in, in the resistance when he's imprisoned with, with them. And it is this, and it's this kind of contradictory moment because it's, it's not a political action at that point. It's just revenge, as this person has done so many horrible things. That's also a human moment in this text. This just, I mean, he's, he's killed people that these people love. And you know that they, they can't just put personal feelings aside and be political and let justice run its course. Um, and so there are these, you know, despite the kind of the way that people are often ideology or people are politics, there are these human moments, um, these truly human moments, and very unattractive human moments that come into the, the novel as well. I guess we should have said spoiler alert if you haven't finished the book. It's not. It's not. A, that's. It, that's not a big deal. <laughs> that's okay. Um, taking the uh, example of the First Amendment being used to inform people about what's go what was going on in Vietnam, um, and then 1984, which is this very very far looking cautionary tale. Do you think that um, it can happen here was posed more as an informative statement about? the fascist regime in Germany, or more as a kind of far cautionary tale of like, this is how bad fascism would be here. Uh, do you think it really informed people as to the events in Germany? No, because you recognized, you, you need to so know something about Nazism to recognize, I mean, the, to recognize the Nazism, I think, within um, within it can happen here. So for example, the militia are known as the Minutemen, which is a, a great name for them because it both suggests this patriotic past, but also they get to be the MM, like the SS in Germany. So if you didn't know about the SS, you know, you wouldn't really know about that. I think, I mean, Lewis was a satirist, and what you do as a satirist is you exaggerate to get at something true. And I think that what Lewis wanted to do with this novel was to dramatize in as extreme a way as possible the unforeseeable consequences that might attend the election of a demagogue to the presidency. That he was really confronting um, a, a problem that was real and if not imminent, at least within the realm of possibility. I mean, before Huey Long was assassinated in 1935, he had presidential aspirations. He was planning a run for the presidency against Roosevelt in 1936. In fact, there, there's, it's, there've been, there's, there's a, like some people think that one of the reasons that social security legislation got passed, that some of these social programs was as a more moderate version of the kind of wealth distribution. It was a response to Huey Long's popularity. So I, thi I, I, think it, I think Nazi Germany gave Lewis a lot of fodder for the novel, but, he was, um, th but his, his platform was, was in some ways smaller. It's like, th you know, you, you have no idea what will happen if you elect a demagogue. And here's, one, here's the worst case scenario. We have time for one more question. Does anyone have a question who hasn't asked one yet? Does anyone want to complain about the book? <laughs> complain about me. <laughs> um, I, I was also thinking, in addition to that, is not only was he, he showing us the results of electing this person, but also, in the end, it was how difficult the way back to make another major change to, in, the, in the politics of the country to change the living conditions that they created. I'm oh, sorry, I missed, I missed part of that. Could you repeat? Is that um, right? Let's see if I can remember. Oh, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. I know the feeling. Uh, that, the, that the resulting, 
Yeah, well, I think that he showed how difficult it is to find your way back. Once you've made these kinds of changes, it, it was rapidly happening. Additional changes were ap uh, rapidly happening. Changes in education, book burnings, religion, all those things uh, had happened so rapidly. And then when he was in Canada, he wanted to come back and, and, and continue to fight but uh, for a change. But then my thinking was that is such an overwhelming uh, you know, situation with all the odds stock, stacked against you. And uh, so it, it would real, be really difficult to make change again, more positive change in a in, in way. Well, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the far better than being a hero is simply to be the average citizen who speaks out in a timely way with other average citizens. It's much easier to, to be vigilant and to take these small steps than to try to put out you know, the, the, you know, the conflagration that's just consuming the entire country. Absolutely, it's, it's a long road um, to get back to where you started from in, in the novel. We have hope, though. Thank you all so much yeah, for being with us, and please thank Dr. Yerkes.